Principally, I'd like to talk to you about Ready Mix Concrete, what BRMCA are doing in terms of responsibility and sellability of Ready Mix Concrete. I'd like to talk about cementitious products in general and what the Concrete Centre is doing there. Um, I was going to be embarrassed about some blatant advertising for Lafarge, but what Jackie's just done on Loughborough is nothing, so I'm not that embarrassed now. The problem with being late on is you've got to make sure your numbers and facts tally with everybody else's numbers and facts, so you may see some that do conflict a little bit, but uh, my apologies there. So I'd like to talk to you in two ways really uh, about the production of concrete products and what's been done to reduce the impact on the environment through production and then those products in use. So I'll split the presentation in, in two parts. So in terms of production, uh, as Andy said earlier on, uh, BRMCA and uh, MPA, the Concrete Centre, have signed up to sustainable sourcing. That strategy went through. So clearly we're committed to those targets and those results. BRMCA represents 85% of UK ready mix concrete production. We signed up to that and 93% of the members of BRMCA have all signed up to that document. Uh, if you haven't seen it, there's something on your desk uh, which shows you all about it and the website's available. Those are some pretty tough targets in there. As Andy said, we've achieved the targets for 8, 9, 10 and 11 and we've now set targets right through to 2020. So please do take the time to look at that. Responsible sourcing, my number here of 93% is of BRMCA members, so it is the same number as the 88% you saw earlier. Uh, but it, the important thing I'd like to point out is how far ahead of the government's target we are. Now to achieve that number is not easy. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and frankly it takes a lot of money to get there as well. And really it's important people recognise that and put a value to it. A lot of things we do in sustainability are good business practice. They reduce waste and they're very sensible. Some are just very expensive and if customers don't value it, people will stop doing it. So please let's make sure we live up to these expectations because sustainable products are generally more eco-friendly but some things are expensive to achieve and if customers demand it, please let's make sure you value it as well. Environmental management, uh, in terms of environmental management systems, you can see there in terms of ready-mix plants and cement works and restored quarries. That particular photograph there is the National Memorial Arboretum. It is a restored Lafarge quarry. Uh, I recommend you do visit it. Uh, but you can see there, 700 triple SIs are on restored quarries. So there's quite a lot we do in terms of biodiversity and environmental management. Okay, so all that sounds nice, uh, it's all very important, but fundamentally we make concrete. Concrete uses cement, cement has CO2, we have a problem. So there's a lot can be done. Uh, you heard earlier on about the use of replacement fuels, burning tyres, burning solvents, burning sewage pellets. That kind of thing is being done and that vastly reduces the CO2 through the heating. There's the chemical element, the conversion of calcium carbonate releases carbon dioxide when you make cement and it's very hard to address that in the production of cement. Although again, some examples given of different chemical formulas burnt at lower temperatures will help. But one thing we do do is use replacement products. So fly ash, blast furnace slag, limestone fillers are all put in cementitious products routinely. Over 80% of Lafarge's ready mixed concrete contains some form of cement substitute. So it is very, very widely used and widely available. And again, people should specify that wherever they can. Working on specification also helps. You can see on the slide there, if we can look at the strength for foundations on 56 day strengths rather than 28 day strengths, it will allow much greater use of cement substitutes and hence much more sustainable product usage. So please, in terms of specification and design, work out what you need, not what you'd like to have, because the gap between those two can make a big difference in terms of CO2 and footprint. Now, in terms of that embodied CO2, it must be taken in context with whole life CO2, and I will come back to that a little bit later when we go into the, the usage of the products. Waste, you heard the number from, from Andy earlier, 47 times as much waste is consumed in ready mixed concrete as is manufactured. 47 <coughs> times as much. We really do not have an issue with waste. Ready mixed concrete has no packaging. Generally, we know the precise volumes. We rely on our customers to an extent for that, but we know what we deliver at least. 
uh, and any returns are recycled. Speaking of which, recycled aggregates. 28% of the UK's aggregates are recycled. That's the highest figure in Europe. Essentially everything that is produced is recycled. There is essentially no demolition waste goes to landfill in the UK today. Uh, there's a strong pull for it and really the more the economy turns up and more demolition takes place, there's more arisings, the more arisings, the more recycled material will be used in construction. I was at a, a meeting in London yesterday and we looked out of the window from the building we were in and we could see a demolition project next door. And in fact, we could actually see where the material was being taken and used from the building. Now that's one of the issues we face in ready-mix concrete. It doesn't make a lot of sense to haul demolition rubble from central London, 10 miles out of London, to make it into concrete and haul it back again. Generally, it's used within two or three miles of where it's made. So that 28% to say everything that's made is used. Often people say to us, customers say, can we have recycled material in it? The answer is yes, of course you can, but actually we may be hauling things further to deliberately put recycle in your concrete to haul it back again. So it might not always make sense, but the answer is yes, we can put it in concrete. So to wrap up in terms of production, uh, a very sustainably produced product from plentiful raw materials. Now I, I heard a, a sort of vaguely humorous stat the other day that said from the steel industry that said that iron is the most abundant element on the earth. It's actually the word on is not quite right there, it's in, because it's mostly in the middle and it's not very accessible. So if we look at on the earth, the bit we sort of live on, the most abundant material is silica rocks. And that's what we make, uh, essentially, the raw materials of concrete out of, the aggregates. The second most abundant is calcareous rocks, and that's what we burn to make cement. So the most abundant material readily available is what we use to make uh, cement and concrete. But of course, that product itself is, is very much only half, or I would argue probably a lot less than half of the story. What are we actually going to do with it? Because nobody really wants a meter of concrete. You want to build something with it. So I'll look at use, and I'll look at design. So starting off with use, think of those the factors there on the, uh, the left-hand side. All of those are factors which would influence material choice. And then across the top are the, the three pillars of sustainability, uh, and you can see the ticks in the boxes there. And really, if we think about each of those and how concrete performs in each of those examples, and I won't go through every one of them, but I'll, I'll pick a, a few off for you. So what this chart shows on the left-hand side is the number of incidences, and on the bottom is the square meterage of damaged cores in a fire in a domestic dwelling. And what it's showing is that there is less damage caused in a traditional built, a heavyweight built, a concrete built dwelling than in a timber dwelling. Now at this point you might think I'm stating the bleeding obvious. What I'm telling you is wood burns and concrete doesn't. Okay? But it's important you understand that and actually you can see here that the uh, Department for Communities and Local Government have confirmed that wood is more burnable than concrete. <laughs> and actually the best example actually was from Martin at a meeting I was at last week where he said well when we do a fire test in a concrete building we fill it full of wood and we set the wood on fire and see if the building damages or not. And they're telling us wood burns and concrete doesn't. But anyway, there you go. Robustness. Um, concrete barriers, they've been specified in the UK now for motorways for about five years. And if we think back to those three pillars earlier, um, if you imagine one of those trucks gets a blowout and comes crashing into that barrier, social. Will your family be hurt if you're driving on this carriageway? No, they won't, because that truck will bounce off. So, Economic, well, that should not get damaged. So therefore, there'll be no need to close the road, there'll be no need to repair it, there'll be no need to have all the traffic jams and delays. And, in, oops, and environmental, well, that should be completely maintenance-free for about 30 years. So environmentally, that has to be the best solution. Okay, thermal mass. Now this came from Construction News in uh, 2005. I think it was David Taylor who wrote the article. And I, I mean, I, I've got to say, I like the quote. It's very, very clear. It asks a very sensible question. I like the argument, but I'd feel happier if someone could just check that the CO2 savings you get from a concrete building compensate for the large quantity of CO2 driven into the atmosphere. That's a, that's a very sensible question, because we talk a lot about thermal mass, 
but the building itself has the embedded carbon. And so what the concrete centre did was get Arup to do an investigation, and there's the results. So I'll get my notes out here to make sure I've got all the right numbers. So on day one, we have two houses. Lightweight, which essentially is timber walls, timber floors, downstairs, upstairs. Medium heavyweight is uh, block walls downstairs, concrete floor downstairs, timber floor on the first floor. Now that makes me th sort of think of something is, whoever thought of putting a timber floor on the first floor of a house? You know, what is the point of that? Because people realise that heat rises and noise moves and why do they do that? And you're going to be thinking, at some point, somebody will realise it's a stupid thing to do. And so I look back, and, and uh, Professor Saki said earlier on that in 1824, Portland cement was invented. Invented here in the UK. More importantly, invented in the great city of Leeds by a gentleman called Joseph Aspdin. And in 1824, he invented Portland cement, which needs keeping dry. 180 years later, Lafarge put it in plastic bags. So it took 180 years to go, we should keep that dry. Should we wrap it in plastic rather than paper? And 10 years later, there's still only Farge that actually wraps it in plastic bags. So it, that took 180 years. I'm just hopeful that at some point somebody will think, you know, when kids run around upstairs and it's really noisy, why don't we make that floor out of concrete? And, and all the heat tends to, to rise upstairs. That's, that's stupid, isn't it? We should trap it downstairs. But anyway, anyway, that's the, light, that's the medium weight house. Sorry, I digress. Um, so on day one, the medium... Uh, weight house has 1.25 tonnes more embedded carbon than the lightweight house. That's the difference on day one, okay? The payback period here, when the two lines cross over, is 11 years. So after 11 years, the total CO2, embedded and consumption, becomes less in the medium weight house. And if we move out to 60 years, which is the government's figure they use for doing the calculation, the gap here then is 16 tonnes. Now our argument would be, of course, if you'd built the house properly in the first place, it would last more than 60 years. Because it's a concrete house and it will certainly last 120 years because what can go wrong? It's a concrete house. Uh, but anyway, on the 60 year calculation, then you see that actually, to answer the question, the payback is comes at 11 and it keeps on going in perpetuity and the longer you move this out those two lines are diverging the bigger the gap will become. Uh, same done in terms of offices um, so uh, again the calculation done here um, the scenario chosen um, is the worst case for the concrete building and that was done for a reason because the concrete center has very little money and they can only afford to do this once and if we'd done it on something that was actually better for concrete, it's almost certain somebody would sort of, yeah, but what about? So we went for the very worst case for concrete, the best case, the alternative, and thought, at least now, we've covered all the options. And in this worst case, you can see that the offset period is six years. So if you're using the embedded and the consumption, six years is the crossover. In a better case, and there are a lot of examples, we have one-year paybacks. A lot of examples of one-year paybacks. So this is, a, as I say, the worst case. So we move forward from 2005, we get to 2012, and you can see the steel industry has come along now and said, OK, thermal mass is important. And this is a major step forward, because our number one concern has to be to have thermally efficient buildings. Whether they're made of steel or made of concrete, they have to be thermally efficient. And the fact we've now moved the argument forwards is very important. We can now stop fighting about the facts. We know the facts. A heavyweight building, a thermal mass building, is going to be the best way to build. Full stop. And now we're all agreeing. The question really is, how do you best achieve that thermal mass? How much concrete do you need in those buildings? And I'll show you an example in, uh, a bit later on in terms of active use of thermal mass, which suggests probably about 300 mil is the right thickness to have. Now, on the other hand, it's a little bit like loft insulation. Can you ever have too much? And the more concrete you have, the more thermal mass effect you will get to a point. Uh, but 300 mil does appear to be about the right number. So just look at some of those other features of, of, uh, of concrete. Um, this presentation was actually mostly written by Andrew Minson, the CEO of the Concrete Centre, and he is a PhD engineer. And this is one of his photographs and it's about durability, and it probably couldn't be a better engineer's picture to have. 
These are obviously gravity bases for offshore wind. Um, if we think about durability, that needs designing to be floated out into the sea. It gets sunk, it gets ballasted, it gets a mast stuck on top. In 50 years time, it has to be unballasted, lifted, floated back and recycled. So it's a pretty good example of durability and a great engineer's photograph. It was then passed to our marketing department who put that photograph in. <laughs> this is actually South Shield Seafront. Uh, the, uh, the sort of design given to the architect was to get something natural, fitted in with the seafront, so in with the environment. So this is all uh, concrete, ready mix concrete. That's pattern imprinted. This is exposed aggregate, uh, different colours to sort of blend in with the sand. But it's all examples of durability. That is a completely maintenance free area there, completely maintenance free. Uh, another one from our marketing department, that is actually Manchester Tramway. In spite of the blue sky, it really is in Manchester. Um, so in terms of those areas of use, um, hopefully we can say that the concrete really does have the best uh, credentials against those three pillars in terms of use. So let's think a bit about, uh, about design. So post-tensioning, in thinking about long spans, post-tensioning clearly is the most effective way of building long spans. We're using all the, uh, the tensile properties of the steel with the compressive properties of the concrete to get the best structural design you can have. And if we go back to that example of, of sort of steel saying thermal mass is important, it really is important. What concrete gives you is thermal mass and flexibility of design. Great flexibility to build great buildings. And that's, that's an example of that. Other examples of flexibility, uh, using void formers to get waffle slabs, to get lightweight, but also get the strength. Here's what I'm saying about active thermal mass. If you put uh, pipes like that with the, with the spines in it, that actually will dissipate heat out or indeed suck heat back in in the winter to actually regulate uh, the efficiency of the rooms. And you can see, I'll give an example later of actually our head office, which uses thermal mass in this principle to both heat the building in winter and cool it in summer. That's a, a ceiling there that's come straight off the formwork. That's untouched. That's come straight out of the formwork and that pattern has come from the formwork. So we think again about sort of uh, efficiency and labour saving and cost saving. What could be easier than strip your formwork and there's your ceiling. You're in the building. Uh, great example there of design and form. That's the Barbara Hepworth Gallery in Wakefield near Leeds in Yorkshire. Um, that's actually Hepworth Brown, that odd colour of purple we have there. It was uh, famous from uh, some of Barbara Hepworth's designs, some sculptures. Um, it's a colour we had to colour match. Uh, we did about, I think it was 5,000 metres we supplied there, uh, and they had to be the same colour from first metre to last metre. But it shows what can be done in terms of an effective design and using those thermal mass durability properties, but actually building it into the shape of the building. Uh, that's a building you may be less keen to visit, uh, Milton Keynes Crematorium. Um, but that, uh, that arch there is cast with self-compacting concrete, uh, using various properties in terms of reflection of sound and light and everything else. Uh, in fact, these walls are made of lignocyte uh, blocks. And what we did is actually uh, got some bush hammered effect concrete to match up to the lignocyte blocks. Uh, and I said earlier, just an example, this is very quickly, it's our head office uh, in Birmingham, Solihull, Birmingham. But we use the, the concrete uh, coffers in the ceiling there to actually uh, absorb um, heat in winter, cool the building down, um, sorry, in summer, and then reflect it back in winter. Um, and the pipe, you can just about see the pipes there, that's where the, the air is extracted and it's blown back through the floor, uh, through an underfloor system like that. So in fact, the building has no air conditioning at all. It is passively cooled by moving the air through the concrete and using the thermal mass of the concrete to cool the building in summer and it preheats the air coming in in winter. Okay, so products that are sustainably produced, their inherent properties are very versatile. Let's remember that we're trying to build something which people want to live in, people want to work in, flexible designs, uh, versatile buildings. Uh, and it can deliver sustainable solutions. And let's remember that's the embedded uh, issues and also usage issues. Okay, if you want to know any more, uh, the website there for This Is Concrete and Twitter's, I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, it's on there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.